All right, so we will be covering intro to JavaScript today. Uh, this recording is meant to be for your reference later on. Um, each sec we have 14 sections to cover about an hour and a half, which is about the amount of time we have remaining. Um, we expect to spend about six and a half minutes on each section. However, the world is not perfect, and this likely will not be true. Some of the sections are optional, okay? So uh, if we go quickly, we'll cover the optional stuff. Um, if not, if we do not cover those things, I can provide references to those such that you can learn them on your own. Okay? Sound good to everyone? Yeah. Cool. Hey, Ian. And hi, person. So come on in, take a seat. And uh, as I was just telling everyone, uh, I am recording this, and this is a crash course, so uh, you will definitely want to use the recording for reference later on. Uh, hopefully everyone already has Node.js and Visual Studio installed. Um, if not, you may want to do so quickly. All right. Uh, just, to just to briefly overview what we'll cover today, we'll make sure that we can run Hello World. This is a tradition. This is a programming tradition. Just to make sure that your software and configuration is ready and good to go. Um, following that, we'll teach you about comments, variables, functions. Conditions, arrays, loops, objects, callbacks, promises, async gateway, modules, classes, and some recommended self-learning. Um, like I said, this is a crash course, okay? Um, and it's possible we may not cover everything, but we're going to try. All right, any questions before we get started? And also, it may bother you, but when I ask for questions, I wait for a few moments because sometimes it takes someone a moment to get the courage to actually ask. So I ask for your patience during those times. All right, so um, is everyone good with the uh, Wi-Fi setup? Uh, not yet. Not yet, okay, cool. So we will keep that up while we're starting. Um, everyone, please open Visual Studio Code if you have not already. Um, we're gonna take a brief moment to make sure that you get that set up. If you uh, click this icon on the top left-hand corner, this is the file explorer. This is for setting up your project, okay? Usually, you write all your code for one folder is one project, and that's just to help keep things organized. Um, so you wanna click open folder and navigate to somewhere of your choice. I use my documents. You wanna create a new folder. Is everyone on Windows? Nope, we got one Mac. Huh? Yeah. Linux. Okay, so this should be similar for you. This will be slightly different for you. Um, if, uh, if there are parts that are not very clear in translating from Windows to Mac, just let me know and I can check. Get up Visual Studio Code. Cool. All right. Um, so go ahead and once you've got this up, create a new folder for your project. I'm going to call mine IntroJS. IntroJS. And then select folder. And then you'll see it do a whole bunch of stuff. Now your project is ready. Okay? And we can start building things. Um, You'll notice this here, this, this is where your files will be listed, okay? So here we have this little, uh, let me actually just double check and make sure the recording's working because this stuff's difficult to see. Okay, great. Um, if you click this new file icon right here, okay, it just gives you a list right in the tree and you can do index.js is traditionally what we make the main file for a project, okay? So go ahead and create an index.js, and you'll see it gets opened in the right pane here. Okay? Is everyone to this point? Cool. Does anyone need a minute? All right, cool. So, hopefully everyone is good to go on that. Um, now, before we get into... Uh, before we get into diving into code, just a brief history of JavaScript, okay? 
because it's good to understand why things are the way they are. Because there will be times where you're writing JavaScript and you'll be like, this is so stupid. Why is it like this? I hate this. There's usually a good reason, or at least a not terrible reason. Um, if you've heard of Mozilla Firefox, the predecessor to Mozilla Firefox was Netscape Navigator. Many of the people who worked on Netscape Navigator later went on to work on Mozilla Firefox. And during those times, the internet was only HTML and CSS. So what you saw on a page, that was it. There was, you could click links to go to other pages, but if you wanted animations or things moving on the page, that was not a thing. Um, and then Netscape uh, wanted to make the web more dynamic. So they actually pursued two things at once. Uh, Java had already existed, and so they talked to Sun Microsystems, who made Java, to basically start incorporating Java into websites, so you could run code inside a website. Um, and simultaneously, they took uh, a man who had designed another programming language, I believe it was called Scheme, and they were going to embed that in, but he was like, no, this is terrible, we're gonna make a new language. That new language was JavaScript, and it was named JavaScript because they wanted to steal people from Java. So there's a lot of confusion these days around, oh, JavaScript is like Java, right? No, no it is not. Um, the syntax is a little bit similar sometimes, but the two languages are very different, okay? Um, another name for JavaScript is also ECMAScript, or ECMA script. If I remember correctly, that's a European kind of technology standards authority. Um, because there was a lot of competition during that time and getting some sort of government authority to approve your programming language as a standard gave you a good edge in the competition. Um, so sometimes you'll hear JavaScript called ECMAScript or ECMA script. It's the same thing, okay? Uh, lastly, you'll hear different things like, oh, ECMAScript 2015 or ECMA script 2016. These are just different versions of the JavaScript language. Um, you'll find that in technology, things change rapidly. And so we try to name things so we know which version of things we're at, okay? So we'll be covering some kind of ECMAScript 2015-ish version of JavaScript. Uh, it is not the latest, but it is what I have seen most commonly in my day-to-day -day work, okay? Um, cool, so any questions about that before we move on? You got a little bit of trivia to surprise your friends with, at least. All right, so let's um, let's go ahead and write our first program, okay? So back in Visual Studio Code, uh, just to make sure we have everything working properly on your computer, um, I'm not going to explain it yet. I promise I'll explain later, but just type this exactly as you see it here. Oops. And it must be exactly like this, okay? Can everyone see this okay? Do you need the text to be larger? Is that a single quote or a double quote? Uh, I'm using a single quote, but either will work. But that suggests that this should be bigger, so give me a moment. Okay, cool. Oop, okay, I'm gonna assume people are done with this, and we're gonna full screen now. Is that better? Great. Okay, does everyone have this typed? Okay, now. A Visual Studio Code thing. You'll see this file name here, right? And you see this dot, this white dot. This means that there are changes that you have written that have not been saved. White dot bad, <laughs> okay? So you want to get in the habit of saving your files. You can move your mouse up here and scroll down and click save, but no, 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 we, we go faster than that. You're gonna be typing, okay? You don't wanna to have to move your hand to the key to the mouse. Do control S to save, okay? And then you'll see the white dot disappears. So everyone's good? Cool, now, last piece is up at the top here, do terminal, or you can do control shift tilde on Windows. On Mac it'll tell you what the, uh, what the shortcut is, I don't know it off the top of my head. It is uh, control shift tilde, it's the same actually. Um, and go ahead and click this and you'll see a terminal pop up. I'm gonna have this big crazy error, you can ignore that, you should not see that. Okay, everyone good? 
Cool. Now, if you were here in uh, Git class a couple weeks ago, you'll recognize this. If not, this is the location that my terminal is currently in. It's the folder I'm inside. Okay. Now, Visual Studio Code is nice because it automatically puts us inside our project folder. In, uh, ah, intro JS, intro JS. Okay. So we don't have to do anything fancy. We're already in the project. We can get started. Now, if you have installed Node correctly, and if you have typed what I have written up here correctly, this should print hello world. Node space index dot JS. Has everyone got that? All right, congratulations on your first JavaScript program. All right. Uh, this is a tradition to make sure that our environment is set up correctly, that all of our software is installed, that all our configurations are good, all these kinds of things. So check off the list. All right. I, I promise I'll explain what this means in a minute. But there's something more important I need to show you. Um, I'm going to bring this down a little bit. Um, if you go to a new line and you type two slashes, okay, you'll see that the color changes. All these colors are to help you visually. Okay, because if you're just looking at a wall of text, it's difficult to see what's going on. The colors help your eyes catch things more quickly. If you type here and you run the program again, whoops, I did not save. Remember to save. Nothing changes. Okay, it just still just prints hello world. This is a comment. Okay, the reason this is the first thing I teach you is because we are human and our memories are terrible. You can use this to keep notes. Comments are where you keep notes. How do things work? Why did you do things this way? What is something you have to do later? What is a mistake you encountered that this fixes? You want to take notes on these kinds of things inside your code, okay? Especially during a class, because a week later when you look at this, you're gonna be like, what the hell does this do? If you write a comment for yourself, you can help yourself remember. All right, this is one type of comment. A second type of comment is if you do star or slash star and star slash, then you can type anything anywhere in here and it will be ignored by JavaScript. Okay? Has everyone got that? Cool. So, for purposes of just having a reference, this is a single line comment and it won't be executed or it won't be run. This is a multi-line comment that will not be run. Cool. All right, so that's one section down in less than six and a half minutes, so I think we're doing pretty good. Questions about comments? It doesn't autofill when what? Right. Um, so the question was again, this is just for the recording. Um, the question was why does autofill happen up here in our JavaScript file but not down in our terminal? Is that correct? Um, that is. How deep do I want to go? Uh, your normal default terminal does not do autofill. Um, what's happening here is this terminal is actually not part of Visual Studio Code. This is actually PowerShell, which is Windows thing. So I can run PowerShell, right? And that's a separate program. Okay, so what's happening is Visual Studio Code is running PowerShell inside Visual Studio Code. So because PowerShell doesn't have completion, so if I do get profile, like no autocompletion, but I think that's a function. Oh, oh, ha, ha, I'm wrong. There is autocomplete. Yes, I, huh. Well then, I stand corrected. Maybe autocomplete works, but uh, the last time I wrote uh, PowerShell was in 2011, and I don't remember any PowerShell, so. Um, Additionally, uh, I don't know if PowerShell recognizes when you want to file versus when you want to command. Um, I have never written a shell, so I don't know how those things work. 
Uh, however, there are shells that do autocomplete, and you can install them and configure them. I just don't know of any of them because I don't work in shell enough. So, does that answer your question? Cool. Any other questions before we move forward? Cool. All right. So, um, we're going to leave this hello world here just for kicks. Um, and we will move on to variables. So, um, when you're working in software, right, everything is just manipulating data, right? You have some text in your chatting app that you want to get to another person, right? Or maybe you're graphing something and you have to track all the data points in the graph, right? Um, data needs to be stored somehow in your software. Uh, we do this with variables. Who remembers algebra? Of course you do. He has a math background. And he's my friend. So if you remember algebra, this will be helpful. If you don't, we'll, we'll, we'll help you remember, OK? Um, so in, in like algebra, you would have like x equals 12, y equals mx, m times x plus b, right? You don't, don't type this. I'm going to get rid of this in a second. Or maybe you could use this as a comment. But um, so variables serve the same purpose in programming. You can define some variable named x, and you can put some value inside of it, and then you can use it later to do stuff, OK? It's the same in programming as it is in algebra. The difference is that we don't have to use one, one letter. We can use this new variable name equals 12, and that's OK. Right? Um, we also don't have to store only numbers. We can store text. So if you, if you put single quotes or double quotes around text, JavaScript treats it like data. Okay? So this is data that can be sent to places and done stuff with, whereas this is a variable. This is now part of the language, kind of. Okay? So variables and function names, we'll cover function names later, but variables do not have quotes. Text data has quotes. Single or double is okay. Okay, and you can also mix. So if I wanted to say, um, or if I did something like this, can't use single quotes, oh, that's a problem, right? Because then here, my text data ended, and now JavaScript is looking for a variable or a function named t use single quotes. That's no good. So what you can do is you can surround it in double quotes, and then you can use single quotes inside, or the other way around. Alternatively, if you don't like that, um, if you put a backslash before it, it will treat it like a normal quote, rather than treating it as a, oh, the data is stopping. Okay. So cool, that's great. Um, so we can store data in this way, and we can use it later. But this as written will not work. Let me throw this in a comment real quick. Um, because JavaScript, where is my cursor? Holy crap, okay. Really? Whoa! Okay, we don't need this anymore anyway. Um, JavaScript doesn't know what this is initially. It, know it's some, it knows it's something, but it doesn't know exactly what. It's going to think that this variable already exists. We have to tell JavaScript we are making a new variable, okay? To do so, you can do one of two things. You can write const, and then the name of the variable, and then equals some data. Or you can do let, and this is a variable that can change. OK? Now, the difference between these two, these are both variables technically. Um, this is actually a constant, which means that this, or rather this, cannot change. Okay? If you do let, this can change. Okay? Both of them tell JavaScript that this is a new variable. Okay? Does that make sense? Not 
Yes. It, it's a little more detailed than that, but for now, yes. Later, I'll get into more specifics of what that means, but for now, yes. Okay. Any other questions? So. Okay, so you defined uh, this is a variable that can change, uh, this will change, uh, which is a string. Yep. If you were to try and change it with a integer or something else, would it just concatenate or would it have a different effect, like an error? It's a good question. It's too advanced. You're getting ahead of me. I haven't okay. gotten there yet. Come okay. on, man. Does, does that mean you want me to go faster? No, no, no. Okay. It's what popped in my head. Because that's literally what I'm going to do next. <laughs> Any other questions before we go there, though? This makes sense? All right, so um, now, uh, actually, one more thing before that. What's up? Um, for the constant, are there ways of manipulating it to change it at all, or is it completely fixed? Like, this is going to confuse everyone else, but to answer your question, if this doesn't make sense, ignore it for now. I'll, I'm going to explain it in more detail later. You cannot reassign. Okay. You can manipulate the value of the data, you cannot reassign the data. Yeah. I'm going to explain it later. I'm going to explain it later. Okay? Is that all right? Once we get to arrays, I'm going to explain how that works. Um, yeah, that'll be way easier. Let's just save it for arrays. Um, so now, cool, I've defined these variables, but I'm not doing anything with them. They just exist. Right? I'm going to answer your other question after this. So if we do this console.log, I know I haven't explained this yet. I'm holding off on it for now. Okay? Just know that whatever you put between these parentheses gets printed down here. Okay? Now if you take this variable name okay, and you put it here, what JavaScript will do is it will look for where this variable was defined. It will see this, it will be like, this is a variable, I know this. It will go and find this. It will see what value was set to it, and it will substitute that in here. Okay? So this is the same as writing this. Okay? It's just that in this case, this will happen automatically. So now if you have this and you save, and then, whoa, why'd I go back up? And then you run again, you'll see it prints, this can't use single quotes. Okay? In case you have trouble understanding this later on, there's a really good metaphor for this. Um, you can think of a variable like a box, okay? And the box, can, you can put something inside it. You can also put a label on the box. Okay? You can think of this right here as the label for the box. Okay? And you can think of what comes after the equal sign as what's being put inside the box. All right? And whenever you put this label in JavaScript, JavaScript's going to look for that box, find the box with that label, take it, and whatever's inside, it's going to use that. Okay? Um, but you guys seem to understand this without the metaphor, which I very rarely see, so good job. <laughs> Any questions about that so far? Um, yes. Um, so, so... That's a good question. I actually was looking for the same thing. Um, you can set up a shortcut, but it requires a bunch of configuration that I did not want to spend time doing right now. Um, it, it does, but you have to configure it. And that takes time that I did not want to spend. So if you really want to mess with it while we're teaching stuff, you can, uh, you can go to run, and you can do add a configuration. Um, and then you can just do the start debugging. 
Um, yeah. Uh, usually, but I believe in Visual Studio Code, it, uh, yeah, so it, it prompts you which uh, debug configuration you want to use, and if you choose Node.js, it wants to do all sorts of crazy stuff. Oh, hey, it actually works now! When I did this yesterday, it didn't work! Well, that's annoying. Well, yeah, you can use F5 then. But I also tested it on my Mac, so maybe it just requires extra configuration on the Mac. I don't know. Did it work for you? Or you've not oh, tried yet? I, I, I'm using the terminal. I'm not using Visual. Okay, gotcha. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, I guess on Windows you can just press F5 and then choose Node.js. Um, yeah. That's really frustrating because I spent a lot of time trying to get this to work with minimal because I didn't want to have to do all this stuff because that would be time wasted. But yeah, okay. Well, yeah, you can just press F5 and then choose Node.js and it'll work. So, good question, <laughs> and thank you. And then, if you want to collapse this on the left, you can just Control-Shift-D, or you can press this button. All right, so, let's move forward. Uh, now, when I said earlier that you can and can't change certain things, right? Um, if I do this new variable name, also, you'll see this autocomplete. If you get this, you can just hit tab, and it'll finish typing it for you if you don't want to type as much. Um, if you're a little slower typing, that's really helpful. Um, if I try to do something like some other text, right? If I try to run this, I'm just going to do it down here because I don't want to. No, I, I prefer the terminal because I don't like all the windows popping out and stuff. Um, you can just press up to get the last command in terminal. Um, whoa, geez, okay, this is kind of terrible. You'll see it gives us an error. This is what an error looks like, okay? It tells you assignment to a constant variable. Because we defined this one as a constant, it won't let us do this, okay? So this does not work. Cannot assign two constants. All right. However, if we do something like, where is it? My scrolling is terrible. Okay. If we change this variable, okay. You can still see that. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Also, I should probably just get a new mouse because the scrolling on this one's all terrible. Um, as you can see, ugh, okay. Um, now, if we if we change the other one, the one that has the let, okay, so this one here, you see we can run this just fine, okay? Now, nothing new prints because we haven't done a console log, but just to show you the difference between let and const, okay? Um, now, another thing, is um, if you want to add text to this, it's very simple. You can do this is a variable that can change equals this is a variable that can change plus even more text. Okay, and this is how you can combine text. All right. So if we console.log this. All right, don't forget to save. And if you print this out, you'll see some other text and then even more text. Okay. Um, now this, this really sucks to type, right? This is really long, not fun. Um, there's a shortcut for this. If you do, this is a variable that can change and then do plus equals, okay? Uh, this does the same. This, this is the same as this. Wah. Okay. So if we run this now, oh, sorry, I didn't console log it.
more text. Okay? Everyone good so far? Cool. Um, what else we got? Now, everything we've been doing has been with text, right? Um, we actually call text strings in programming, okay? Uh, because text is actually a whole bunch of characters. Each of these is a character, right? And when you put the characters together, we say it's a string of characters, okay? So we call this a string. So going forward, I'm going to call text strings, okay? So please do not get confused. Um, so, hello. Um, so we've only been messing with strings right now, right? But we can also do numbers and other things. But things get a little strange when you combine them. If I do something like this is a variable that can change plus equals one, what do you think will happen? Sorry? I wish. <laughs> and as much as I hate it, Ian is correct. Um, uh, this, this will just add the number one to the end of the string. Because Java has, or JavaScript has no respect for data types. No respect. <laughs> So you can, and I think uh, I want to do something risky here because I don't remember exactly what happens. But I think you can also multiply. And I believe, I did not check this beforehand because you, you very rarely do this actually. But I think, no, okay. This, this is why it bothers me that JavaScript does not respect types. Um, so this will convert the number one to a string and concatenate it, or let's say add it to the end of the existing string. Okay. This produces an AM, which is not a number. And that's just that's just stupid. <laughs> I hate this. But, yes, yes, this guy gets it. Um, I actually don't know TypeScript. I, I'm going to learn it soon. Um, but conceptually, I love it. <laughs> um, so when you start mixing your data types, numbers, string, booleans, nulls, which I'm going to explain in a second, just be aware that when you mix things, you want to test because it may operate in unexpected ways. Because um, I think... There's some language, I forget if it's Python or Ruby or something, where if you multiply by two, it'll just repeat the string however many times you've written it. Yeah, yeah, it's like, what? What? No. Um, so that's a thing, okay? So NAN is a special value. It means not a number. It means that you tried to do some sort of numerical operation, and it gave you something weird instead, okay? Um, this is bad and I hate it. Um, uh, other things we can do, ah, let's do more data types. So we can, um, uh, whoa, nope, 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 nope. More data types. So uh, we, we've covered strings, right? So let's actually do something like this. Uh, so we've covered strings, right? We've covered numbers, right? But wait, there's more. Um, there's also true and false, and these are Boolean. So you can do const my bool equals true. This is a thing, okay? Um, and it will be very useful later. But for now, just know that it exists. Um, uh, we also have null. Which, mean, which is a value that means an absence of value, which can be really confusing because there's also an undefined, um, which means that you've tried to reference a value that doesn't exist. An undefined and null are very different. 
and you will learn to hate them. Um, null means that a value has been set to a lack of a value. Okay? That means someone has done something to say, there is nothing here. I'm saying there's nothing here. And undefined means there was never anything there and we don't know where it came from. Sorry? I mean, it, it means the value doesn't exist, right? Yes, exactly. Um, so these two can get a little bit confusing for beginners. Okay? So we'll, we'll, later on we'll do a couple of examples of like when null and when undefined. But for now, just know that they exist and they're different. Sorry? Oh, it very much matters. It very much matters. Yeah. Um, yes. Any other question? Yeah. Is one true and zero false? Yes. Um, we're actually going to cover that later. Um, we're going to cover what values are truthy and what values are falsy. And uh, are there quotes? Yes. So um, JavaScript actually has a... Uh, Oh, my memory is messing with me here. Uh, in other programming languages, um, you have data types of like integer and float, and they are separate data types. JavaScript just has number, and they can be anything. That's a number. Or not a number. Yeah. What's up? Does that mean the behavior can change based on like there being a decimal point? Does that mean the behavior can change if there's a decimal point? Like if you... Uh, no, because they're both number types. Okay, so the behavior is consistent. Generally, yes. Okay. Uh, there are um, some unusual exceptions. For example, there's a parse float function and a parse int function. Um, and those will take a string and convert it to a number type, but only an integer or a float. And it'll throw an error if it's not that. Um, but yeah. If you didn't catch that, don't worry about it. That's way more advanced than we're doing today. Okay. Any other questions before we move forward on data types? Character type? Or is it just strings? That's actually a good question. I'm not sure. I think there's only strings. Okay. I think there's only strings. I'm not 100% sure. Next, like, <laughs> I have never encountered a character type in JavaScript. So in other programming languages, remember previously how I said these are characters and together they form a string? Um, in other programming languages, characters and strings are completely separate things. Or rather, rather, characters are a thing, and then a string is actually an array of characters. But we have not covered arrays yet. We'll get there in a minute. Okay. So I'll explain that more when we get to arrays. All right. Any other data type questions? Yes, it is a JavaScript specific thing. Uh, so in those cases, so so the question was if if you don't know what the data type is going to be or you want to kind of ignore what the data type will be, um, can you use undefined? Um, theoretically, yes. Please don't. <laughs> um, instead, you should use null for that because it means you are setting this to an empty value. Undefined means this value has not been defined. It does not exist. It never did exist. It is not expected to exist. And this is why JavaScript can be very confusing. Okay. Um, I know this may not make a whole lot of sense now, but I'm going to ask you to just kind of like box that away for a minute. I promise you we'll cover null, the differences between null and undefined a little bit later. Okay? Good? All right. In the interest of time, we're going to move forward. Um, other types include uh, arrays and objects, but we're going to cover those later. Okay? Cool. Um, and that covers it for variables. Next up is functions. Okay. Um, so functions, let's say you have a bunch of logic, right? Like maybe you need to search for something, or maybe you need to do some sort of math 
and maybe you need to change some string in some way, right? And let's say it's like 50 lines of code long, right? But you have to do it a bunch of times. You don't want to have to write that whole 50 lines of code again. That's stupid, right? There's a concept in programming called dry. It's short for don't repeat yourself. So what you can do is you can take this, these 50 lines of code and you can define them as something called a function, right? Kind of similar to a variable, where the function has a name, similar to the variable has a name or a label, like I mentioned earlier. And if you use that function name in a certain way, it will execute that 50 lines of code for you. And you don't have to write the 50 lines again. You just do the name. Okay? And this is dry. This is not repeating yourself. This is saving yourself typing. Okay? So this is why functions are useful. And functions uh, more or less have three parts. You have your input, you have your work, and you have your output. Okay? Um, so defining a function, there's actually a whole bunch of ways to do it. We're just going to cover one, and then I'll show you the different ways. But a function, we're going to do an example function called add. And this is the normal syntax for writing a function. Well, not the a normal syntax for writing a function. Okay? Use the keyword function, followed by the function name, followed by parentheses. Actually, you know what? Let's let's do sorry, getting ahead of ourselves. Before we do that, let's do um print hello. Okay, let's do this. Um, so the, the, the keyword function, the name of the function, parentheses, and then these curly brackets. If you've never used these before, on your keyboard, uh, next to the P key or the, uh, in Hangul it would be the all E key, I believe, to the right of it, you should see the square brackets. If you hold shift and hit those, that's the, that's the curly brackets. Is that right? Actually, I could have checked here, but whatever. Um, and then this is the name of the function that you can use later, right? And then what's in here, what's in between these curly brackets, is, are, is the code that will be run any time you use this function name. Okay? So now we're not going to write a 50-line function because we don't got time for that. But we can do an example of console.log hello. All right. And let me, uh, while we're typing this, let's do function keyword, function name, parentheses, curly brackets, and then inside curly brackets is the logic. Okay. And I'm going to share this code online too both the video and the code. So now if you do print hello, if you write it exactly like this, you do need the parentheses. The parentheses are required. Okay. What will happen is JavaScript will go and find this, and it will execute these steps. Okay. So if we save, and we run it, you'll see it prints hello down here. Okay. Questions about that so far? Uh, man, I believe so, but only because JavaScript. <laughs> um, what JavaScript actually does is, uh, let's actually test that, just because I, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's right. God, I hate JavaScript. Yeah, that's right. Um, what the hell? Yeah. Um, what, what, so normally programs run in order, but JavaScript will take any function definitions and move them to the top. Um, because JavaScript. Um, but that can actually be kind of useful in some cases. Um, for example, uh, I know that a lot of the European programming standards, you have like your core logic at the top, and then you have all your definitions at the bottom. Whereas like the American standards have all your definitions at the top and then have your logic at the bottom. This is actually better for the European style, but 
whatever. Um, so yeah, you can actually have the print hello above, below, wherever. Um, but yeah. So, good question. Thank you for asking. Any other questions? Cool. Um, so now we talked about input logic and output, right? But there's no input or output here, right? Now technically this output's undefined. Just a kind of preview when we get to undefined later on. But if we want to do um, input and output, let's let's use this add example, okay? What is in between the parentheses is the inputs, okay? Uh, parentheses. It's odd grammar, but whatever. Um, now, what happens is these get treated like variables. Okay. So later, when we call the function, um, actually, let's just go ahead and write an example real quick. If we do add two and three. What happens is, because of the position, A gets set to 2, and B gets set to 3. Okay? So that's how you do inputs with functions. And then outputs, you need to use the return keyword. Okay? So then we can do return A plus B. Okay? So outputs, okay, so, so we have this return keyword, it's outputting, but what, what does that mean? That means we can actually assign a variable to our function name. So whatever comes out of the return here gets substituted here. Okay? So this actually acts kind of like a variable. So this a plus b, whatever that ends up becoming, gets put here. So in this case it would be 5. And then sum will equal 5. Okay, let me actually make that a little bit clearer. There we go. Okay. Any questions? It's the same as if you did A plus B. So this is the same. What is this typing? Okay, same as const sum equals A or 2 plus 3. If you don't accept the arguments, will you get a warning or error? No. If you do this, welcome to JavaScript, by the way. If you do this, I'll give you one guess what B will be set to. No. Undefined. No. Undefined. Undefined. Okay, wonderful. I hate JavaScript. I'm not crying, you're crying. <laughs> Are you starting to get a better understanding now? Or? Yeah. Now we could do we could do this. And then three would be null. Because we explicitly said there's a lack of value here. There's a null value here. But if the value is never defined, it's undefined. So if I if I if we do a little bit of debugging here, if I change my add function and I do console A and then console B, right? And then if we do this uh, add two here. Ooh, baby. What do we got? Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got that. I'm an idiot. Sorry, guys. I messed up. Thank you, yeah. Lug? I don't even want to know what that is. It sounds terrible. Okay. Yeah, B is undefined. Welcome 
JavaScript Ian. So um, Ian's actually a friend of mine. He has a Python background, and this is his first time doing JavaScript, so he knows programming already, and he's probably crying inside right now. Oh, my bad. More C++ and Java. Okay, so I'm going to comment these out for now. Oh, here's a, here's a fun tip. If you want to um, keep code written for your reference, but you don't want it to execute, you can comment it, right? And in Visual Studio Code, if you do control slash, it'll just comment the whole line for you. So, nifty little trick. How are we doing on time? Mm, tight, but okay. All right. Any other questions about our add function? Let's bring this down a little more. Parents, what parameter inputs? Inputs are also called parameters. That's what I. That's why I typed parents because I got confused. Parameters and inputs together. Which yeah. So these inputs we also call them parameters. Okay. You'll hear both terms used interchangeably. Parameters is probably more popular. Okay, so the a param the first parameter, the second parameter, a is a parameter, b is a parameter, parameter, parameter because repetition is memory. Okay, good. Can you assign the title to the parameter? No, not in JavaScript, but you can in TypeScript, <laughs> which uh, TypeScript is actually a layer over JavaScript, um, where you can specify the types for everything. But then you need something to translate TypeScript into JavaScript, because a lot of stuff doesn't run TypeScript directly. Um, but TypeScript will do all this type checking for you. Um, but not everyone uses TypeScript. Uh, it's not super popular in Korea yet, but it's becoming popular. Um, so if you want to learn TypeScript, you'll be ahead of the curve, but you should probably know JavaScript before TypeScript. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Other questions? You like my dance? Okay. All right. Um, ah, one more thing. Um, uh, in between the curly brackets is called a block. Okay. So there will be times when you're talking with other engineers um, that they'll say, "Oh, move this block elsewhere," or something, right? If you see curly brackets, we call that a block. Okay, but not only a block can also just be a section of code. Um, but this is kind of the academic definition of block. Okay, so if I said the function block, it would mean the part of the function in curly brackets. Good. Cool. Get some vocabulary going here. All right. Now um, I mentioned earlier there's a bunch of different ways to write functions. Let's cover that real quick. This is just a reference. You don't necessarily need to memorize this, just recognize it. Um, so we did, um, let's do uh, different. Really, Visual Studio Code doesn't autocomplete multi-line comments? Um, uh, different function syntaxes. Um, so what we have is we have function name param Right. Um, you'll notice that in this format, no semicolon required, which I suck. I forgot to tell you, almost everything ends with a semicolon, except for blocks. Blocks don't end with semicolons, but you probably noticed that just from watching. Um, so this is the syntax that we showed you. You can also set a function like a variable. So you can do const name equals function, you can do like this. And I believe in this case you do need a uh, semicolon. Well, not need. JavaScript doesn't need semicolons, but you probably should use semicolons. Otherwise, you can sometimes get some weird behavior. Um, so this is another way. Okay. And yet another way is arrow function. Okay. These are all the same. Well, there's like tiny differences, but for the beginner level, these are all the same. 
Okay. In ECMAScript 2015 and up, which is most of what's used today. Okay. So basically, these two use the function keyword. This one doesn't. Um, these two uh, use a function like a variable. This one does not. Questions? So the line on the second, uh, no, the example on the second line, that uh, function keyword, it has to be a function, yeah? Yes. It can't be any other way. Yes. I'm sorry, I forgot to include param here, but yes. That is correct. Um, you'll find that this one is arguably the most popular. But this one is easier to understand when you're starting out. So I would say when you're starting out, do this one. It's just easier to understand. But be ready to recognize this. Because people are too lazy to type the word function. What's up? So the uh, equal size greater than sign, um, does that have another definition? Like, is it greater than or equal to? No, actually. Okay. Swap them. Okay. And, and then you get that. Okay. Yeah. Um, this one is actually called an arrow function because it's an arrow. But yeah. So, and Ian's question probably makes no sense. We're going to cover it when we get to conditions, which is next. <laughs> Keep getting ahead of me, Ian. All right, everyone's good on functions, though. Cool. And, uh, are we doing on time? Still type, but still good. Uh, we might not be able to do modules and classes, but we'll see. Um, all right, so conditions. So this is all great. We we have we have code. We can we can store data. We can write function. Oh, sorry, sorry. One more thing about functions. This is just a function. Okay. The dot we're going to get to later, but this is just a function. Okay. And what you type in here is the parameter. So now this makes more sense to everyone. Um, so so we, we can store data in variables. Um, we can change variables. We can do functions. We can input from functions, output from functions. But our program isn't making any decisions yet. right? There's been no decision making. There's no actual logic. There's just steps happening. right? Um, but to make interesting programs, we need some sort of logic. The program needs to make decisions based on some sort of input or some sort of action or something. And this is where conditions come in. Okay? Conditions, conceptually, are very simple. If something is true, then do some other thing. So if true, then do. Okay? There's also if true, then do else do something else or if true then do else if something else is true then do else blah, blah, blah. if this doesn't make sense conceptually it may make more sense when you see it written in code so if that doesn't make 100 percent we'll get there okay. um so how do we write this well fortunately yeah this is cold okay sorry i'm actually like Almost sweating. Yes. All right, it's up to twenty three now. It's twenty four or twenty five preferred. Uh, could be that. If uh, if after a couple minutes it's still cold, yeah, let me know and yeah, we'll figure something. Yeah, or you can move or yeah. All right. Uh, right. So um, uh, programming languages at least kind of try to sound like English. So the key word for condition is if. And ooh, fancy Visual Studio Code auto completion, uh, or not. <laughs> um, so if looks like this. If true, then console.log. True is true. Alright. 
Now, what this says is if what is inside the parentheses is true, then do whatever whatever is in this block. Okay. That makes sense, I'm sure. Right. Um, so if we run this, we'll get true is true. Okay. Um, if we do if false, oh, that's cool. Notice how this is slightly darker because Visual Studio Code recognizes that this code will never run because if what's inside the parentheses is false, the block will not execute. Okay. Does that make sense so far? Yeah, because this is considered a normal line of code. Yeah. The, the block itself is just telling it where certain code is starting and stopping. Um, that kind of stuff is actually really interesting, but it's a whole area of study in and of itself. Um, if you want to Google it later, it's called AST. Um, but we are not going over AST. Um, so, good on that. Okay, so uh, this is cool, right? Um, but true and false, there's no decision making going on, right? But let's say let's say I had um, a variable called my number, and let's say I set it to five. Okay, and let's say I had um, another variable called like number limit, and I set that equal to ten. Actually, I'm sorry. Let's let's uh, let's have my number be. Uh, a let be a variable, not a constant. Okay. So note note that I changed const to let. Otherwise, you'll hit an error, and you'll be like, "What the hell, Beef?" Um, now we can do we can do more interesting things. We can say if my number is whoa, hello caps lock. If my number is less than number limit, uh, console log five is less than ten. This will print. Simple. Okay. So in this way, if you have some variable that's being changed by some other process, you can use the value of that variable to make some decision. Okay. Um, uh, there's also. So this is the above is called a comparison. Okay, so the less than is called a comparison operator. Um, and there are multiple comparison operators. Okay. Um, this is great, or this is less than, obviously. This is greater than, obviously. Okay. This is greater than or equal to. There's your arrow, Ian. Less than or equal to. Not equal to, but fuzzy. Not equal to, hold up, there we go. Strict, and equal to, fuzzy. Actually, not equal to, um, not equivalent, because these are different meanings. Uh, equivalent, uh, equivalent, oh my god, typing is hard, okay, let's do this, and then equivalent script. Now you're probably wondering, what the hell is this strict and fuzzy shit? Um, 
And when I first learned JavaScript, I didn't know about strict. And I was like, this is terrible and I hate everything. But since they have both strict and fuzzy, it's actually kind of wonderful. This is something I really love about JavaScript, given the other things that I hate about it. And I'll show you why. If we do this, is this true or false? V votes, votes for true. Votes for false. This is actually true. Okay, this is fuzzy. I know, Ian. I know. Don't cry. Okay. True when fuzzy matching. Now, what about this? What do you guys think? True. Uh, hands up for true. Hands up for false. Good. Not true for strict matching. Okay. So fuzzy matching will um, fuzzy matching will actually convert the data type for you. Okay. So if you're comparing a number, uh, comparing a number and a string, it'll try some type conversions to see if they match up if you try to convert them. Um, Strict is like, no, no, these need to be the same type. And this is actually really nice. There are cases when you will use one over the other. This is super important. This is one you should memorize. Because if you get this wrong, you could have some very bad days. <laughs> I tell you this from experience. What's up? Would this apply to like zero and false? No, you're asking great questions, and you keep reminding me why I hate JavaScript. Um, there's some funny things. Um, so if there are some times where if you compare to a Boolean, you'll get that they don't match, that they're false. But then if you try to use it in a condition, it'll be true. That is something to truly hate about JavaScript. But there's not that many cases where it happens. Um, and I actually have, I actually made a list of some of those things, and it's right here, and I'm going to post it online. And these are things that are truthy and things that are falsy. Okay, and I'm actually, I'm actually going to, just paste this into here for when I post it for you guys. Um, why does it not complete multi-line blocks for me? So looking at that list you just had up, yeah. zero, is, uh, zero is false. Zero is false. So zero in quotes would be false as well? No. Okay. Zero in quotes I, I'm pretty sure is true. <laughs> um, no, it's not converting it. Uh, it doesn't get converted. Though. Right. This is a non empty string. Okay. When you compare string zero to number zero, it's true. When you test it zero, number zero, it's false. When you test it string zero, it's true. Correct. Because for strings, if you just check a string, it's checking to see if the string is empty. So this is an empty string. This is false. But that second thing is null? Nope, that's an empty string. Okay. Good question. Huh? Uh, you have still defined this. You have said this is an empty string. Undefined means nothing has been defined. It does not exist. Where the hell? Where the hell did you get this idea from? This is not a string. But this is different from null also. Correct. <laughs> this is just a string with zero as its text. Because 
because oh, um, because it will try to convert it. So this is um, this is truthiness. Is is what I'm. Thank you. I did not properly explain this. I apologize. So when you do these comparisons, this comparison operator converts to an actual Boolean true or false. Okay. However, it, if accepts things that are not only Booleans. It'll accept anything. Okay? But then if it accepts anything, how do you know if it's not a Boolean, how do you know if that thing is true or false? And that's where this truthiness list comes in. Okay? Does that kind of clear it up for you? Not really. Okay. So if you have an empty string, all right, an empty string, is that a Boolean? It's not a Boolean, right? But if needs to decide if this thing is true or false. So, yeah, there you go. Correct, because it's a non-empty string. Okay. So null is false, undefined is false, empty string is false, zero is false, not a number is false. An empty array is true, but not if you compare an empty array to true in a fuzzy match. An empty object is true, but not if you compare it to true in a fuzzy match. You don't know what arrays and objects are yet. We're going to get there. Everything not listed here, as far as I know, is true. might be things that I'm missing, but in my experience, these are the ones that matter. What is a zero point zero? Good question. I believe that simplifies to zero. Let's test. Because zero dot zero is still zero, logically at least. Oh no, it's not graying it out. Oh, JavaScript, don't do this to me. Okay. Not true. <laughs> that should be true. Because it's a non-zero value. Now, here's the thing. I'm sure that if you add enough zeros before the one, it'll be false, is what I think. Because floating point arithmetic, ooh, no, because of floating point arithmetic, it should still be true. Yeah. If you don't know what floating point arithmetic is, don't worry about it. Way more than we want to cover now. Um, tiny non-zero value is true. Good question. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? Cool. Where the hell are my notes? I need my notes. I don't know what to do without my notes. Okay. What? Oh, dude, get over here. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so um, now this is great. This is fine, but this is only testing one value. But maybe we have something more complicated. Maybe you want to do something if... Only one of these values is true. Or maybe you want to do something if only all of these values are true. JavaScript allows this. So we can do something like if true and no, <laughs> this isn't Python. And false. True and false is false. Okay? This means and, okay? So what it means is if what's on the left side and what's on the right side is true, then true, okay? Alternatively, we can do this. Well, 
sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, okay. If one of these is true, if this or this is true, then true. Okay. Um, what else? Oh, um, oh shit, you know what? I don't actually know the answer to that, because I, I bet one of you is thinking of this question. Um, does JavaScript have XOR? There is not. Okay, cool. Um, XOR is exclusive OR. Is only one of them true? Because OR, if both of them are true, then it's true. Okay? If you want to do an exclusive OR, you have to do something like... Um, uh, oh, God. Testing my logic. I, 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 didn't I, I don't know how I passed logic in college, by the way. Um... No, no, no. Fuck. I don't remember how to write an XOR. <laughs> but um, you can create an XOR with just normal and or not. Um, uh, oh, oh, one more thing. Um, this means not. So you can do if not true. So that won't print. Okay. Um, I forget how to write an XOR. You can figure it out. What's up? Uh, the, the end. The single word doesn't exist. Do they use that? Uh, they do. Okay. What does it mean? And this one? Right? Correct. It's a bitwise and. And we are not going to cover binary operations here. That is, if that's that's some like if you're doing that in modern JavaScript, you're doing some crazy crazy stuff. You're doing like some sort of cryptography or something, and I'm not going to teach you guys cryptography. I don't know cryptography. What's up? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, cool. What's up, Jim? Is there a strict and fuzzy hand and <laughs> It doesn't make sense necessarily that they would exist, but... No, because um, uh, if you're doing comparisons, your strict and fuzzy should be at the comparison level, not at the yeah. conjunction level. That's bitwise. No, it's, it's logical too. I think so. What? Well, let's try it. Let's try this. Bitwise, but I don't know. Let's try. <laughs> I learned a thing. Thank you. So he made a true statement: five is still one to five, and then a false statement: no. And the carrots, little uh, delta, um, means XOR. It means this oh. or that. Only one of them is true. The equal. Okay. Is there from? Is what's the logic behind it? Is it because left to right, or is it because it compares the um, executions first? Oh, you know what? It might be different with XOR. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, this is okay. In the interest of time, yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm actually going to remove this because you're never going to use XOR. Well, you might use XOR. Oh, God. Okay. I've never used XOR. But maybe maybe I should be, and I just don't know it. Put a little note being like, this is more complicated. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, all right. Uh, one more thing. Um, uh, 
if you do something like uh, true and true or false, there is an order of operations, but screw that. Use parentheses. You can use parentheses to group uh, conjunctions. Okay. Hello. Cool. Does that make sense? True or so because this is in parentheses, it happens first. True or false, is that true or false? True. True. And then true and true. It's true. Good? Cool. All right. I hate these earbuds. Um, yes? The true or false is what the true and the false, so it makes more sense. Right, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Same result. Cool. Um, Nifty trick. Um, you can do something like my falsy variable equals null, right? Um, and then you can have uh, const my variable with a default value. You can do my falsy variable or my real value. You look freezing. Do you want to like move over here or something? Okay. Um, this ah, this is a super awesome trick. This is like JavaScript did good with this one um, because this first value is falsy. So null or undefined is falsy. Actually, I think we can just put my non-existent variable. Does that work? I think that works. Nope, nope, that does not work. Okay. Um, that works. Uh, default variable and my variable with the default value. Cool. Yeah. Let's say let's say you want some variable to be some value, um, but the initial value you want to set it to, you don't know if it will exist. Maybe it will be undefined, or maybe it will be null, or maybe it will be zero and you don't want it to be zero, right? If you do this or, and then some other value, if this first one is falsy, it'll get set to the second value. This sounds stupid and terrible, but it is so useful. It is really, really, really useful. Because sometimes you'll be trying to access some value and it won't exist, right? So instead you can set it to some other default value and then that can keep your code from breaking. And it's super helpful. I use this every day. Okay. So you're saying that without this, you would probably have run time errors? Yes. Okay. Uh, cool. All right, so back on to finishing up conditions. Oh, man. Yeah, we might, we're gonna be tight. Okay, I'm gonna try to go faster. Um, if you guys ask me advanced questions, I'm just gonna have to say we're gonna cover it later because we're starting to run out of time. So you can do something like this, right? Whoa. Won't happen. Won't happen. Um, and then you can do this. Because the previous condition was false, this will run. This is in type. Okay. Does that one make sense? So else means that if the condition preceding it was false, then this will happen. If this was true, this will not happen. Okay. Yeah. 
No surprises here. Good? Cool. Um, additionally, you can do typing practice in today. Okay? So you can combine else and if. Okay? So if this is false, it'll go to the next one. All right? Since it'll check the else, since the previous one was false, it'll check this one. It's checking this one, its condition. This is true, so it will execute this. Okay? And then if there's any other else's, whether it's an else if or an else, will not run, because this one was true. Does that make sense? Cool. All right. Uh, also, last thing with this, you can do conditions inside each other. if you want to have like a different condition inside. Okay? Questions? So. Go ahead, Sam. Uh, so we could do something like, um, whoa, okay. Uh, let's do something like this. your question. Now, theoretically, this could be done with an and. Right? These two could be com combined, com com the, 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 combined into an and. Thank you. Um, but uh, I just want to demonstrate. Right? Maybe there's two completely separate conditions, or maybe there's an else, and you need to run the same condition again. Those kinds of things. Um, so yeah, does that make more sense now? Yeah. Cool. So you can put ifs inside of ifs, inside ifs, inside ifs, inside ifs. Usually, if you're going more than four layers deep, you're doing something wrong. Okay? You can probably simplify your logic. Okay? Now that's just a rule of thumb. There can be exceptions. But most of the time, if you go more than four layers in, uh, you can probably improve your code. Okay? So. Else, do you need to have an else? No. Else is optional. Good question. Um, we don't need, we don't always need an else. Cool. Thank you, Ian. Good question. Anything else? Cool. All right. Moving forward. Hunger is real. You guys are getting hungry. Think about what to eat. I failed to look up restaurants around here, so if you guys want to get food together, which I definitely do, if you have ideas, keep oh, them in your mind. Huh? What? Can we? Can we? Uh, that's a good question. Oh, but I think so. I think we're going to stay. 
Yeah, a lot of the places are just going. I, I think that starts at midnight tonight, if I remember correctly. But I could be wrong. We'll have to we'll have to check. So, yeah. Oh, it started today. Uh, okay. Cool. Well, thank you. So then, do you write down the rules? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, well, I guess start thinking about that. I guess I don't know. We'll figure it out. Okay. So moving forward. Um, uh, earlier during data types, we mentioned arrays and objects, right? Uh, we're going to cover arrays now. So, um, arrays look like this, okay? You use curly brackets to um, set up arrays. Now, remember earlier how we were saying like const cannot be reassigned, but technically it can still be changed? Now we're gonna talk about that, okay? So what I can do is um, an array, the purpose of an array is to store multiple values in one variable, okay? Yeah, go for it. Oh, the key, um, if you look straight ahead to your right, you see the bookshelf? It was actually open when I went. Oh, it was? Okay. Yeah. Or, or it's open. Okay. Um, uh, okay, we're going to wait a minute because it's easier to rush. No, I really just need to sit. <laughs> back into it. Um, so arrays are a way to store multiple values in one variable. Um, why is that useful, you might be wondering. I'm going to ask for your patience. Okay. Uh, first, let's just understand how to use or how to work with arrays, and then we'll describe like when and how and why they're useful. Okay. A little bit backwards, but uh, I found that it's just easier to understand that way. Um, so we have this array. If we console.log this guy, um, you're going to see that we get, it's just going to print out these double square brackets just like we have here, right? Um, seems not terribly helpful. But uh, what we can do is we can actually do something like my, uh, is that what I want to do? You know what, we're going to change this. Um, we can actually do something like this. Now, in other languages, usually arrays can only store one data type. But as you probably understood by now, JavaScript just does not care. Um, so we can we can do this. And now you'll see it prints all of these, right? Um, no, no surprises there. But this is this is how arrays are represented in JavaScript. You got those square brackets, okay? Now, cool, we have all these values in this variable. What if I want just one of them? Okay? What you can do is also using the square brackets, 
you can write the position. Okay? So, uh, in programming, restart counting at zero. Zero will give us the first item in the array. Okay? So, if we run this, what will it print? Two. Correct. You got it. Okay? Now, what if I do have a guess at what this will print? I wish. Unfortunately, you're correct. Oh, we said that? You said undefined? Why did I think he said, okay, weird. I think this is messing with my directional hearing. Sorry about that. Um, undefined. Yes, you are correct. Um, yes. Well, here's the thing, right? Remember, remember that um, undefined is falsy. Right? So you can do something like if my array or if if my array one hundred, right? That'll be falsy. Right? So you can you can still work with it. Um, additionally though, um, my array, we're gonna get a little bit ahead of ourselves here because we haven't covered objects yet, but if you do dot length, okay, you don't uh, I haven't taught you what the dot means or why it works or anything. For now, just memorize this. I'll explain the dots and stuff later. This will print how long the array is. Six items. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay? So this is another way you can check if the array has anything. All right? Um, now here's the thing, too. We can do something like console log... Oh, what am I doing? No, no. My array, 0 equals 10. We can change the value. This might seem funky. How did we declare my array? Const. Yeah. Now, the my array variable cannot be reassigned to another value. Okay? However, the value inside it we can still work with. So that's why we can define const for the array, but we can still change things inside the array. Okay? But if we were to try to do my array equals 10, 5, whoa, 10, 5, true, why did I make it so long? Lol, man, null, that would give an error because we're reassigning the value of the variable, not changing the data in the variable. This is a little bit confusing, okay? But remember, it, to, to keep it a simple memory, usually you can use const with arrays. If you don't want to get into the weeds of why this works, that's the kind of simple thought, okay? What's up? If you think so late, you add an extra index. Getting ahead of me, but yes. Okay. Um, but just to demonstrate this one right here, if we do this uh, my array, we can, so this is how we get the zeroth or first value out of the array, right? We can also set that value in the array doing this, okay? So if I do console.log my array again, you will see that the first item is now 10, okay? Questions about that so far? So the first item is going to replace, right? Yes, correct. Um, now, if you want to add on to it, there is, there's a couple ways to do it. I'm going to show you the terrible way first. Um, you can do this. Okay? And here's the terrifying part. <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Does everyone understand that? I mean, do you under? I, 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 
I don't think any of us understand why, but do you understand how it's happening? No. Okay. So what, when we check the length, it checks where the last value is. So even though values uh, 6 through 99 are empty, it's just checking where the last value is. So because the last value is at 100, and we start counting from 0, so it's 0, 1, 2, 3, blah, blah, blah. There's 101 total values, even though most of them are undefined. The length is still going to show up as 101. So the values between position 6 and 100, those are undefined? Correct. They They're undefined. <laughs> they the, the, don't the, exist. The, the, place. the place exists, yes. Okay. The, the position exists, but the value is undefined. That's a good question. <laughs> I really don't know. I could see it going both ways. Um, hold up. Let's let's make this better. My array after changing first value. Because if you try to look at this output later, you're going to be like, what the hell are all these numbers? Um, my array after setting 100 value. And then my array after setting 100 value back to undefined. Undefined. Oh, God, I'm so scared of this. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I hate you. So much JavaScript. I hate it. I hate it. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Why? Why? Because it's telling me you have 101 uh, proper terms, like proper variables, and the majority of them are actually at the time. So it just it means that if you screw up somewhere, you're going to throw a bad value through your code. It, it also means that it's not actually respecting undefined. Yeah. It, like, it could be, if it was checking it properly, it could just say it's only six. It's because array is a special object type, and because um, setting a value, setting a value will not change the length property to a different value. Or will not will not decrement like that doesn't make sense from our architecture perspective. So from designing the language, that makes sense. But we're getting way in the weeds. Don't worry about this. You'll almost never have to worry about that. It's just a fun little trivia fact. Okay. So this is all well and good at accessing values directly. Most of the time, you will not do this. However, you need to know it because sometimes libraries do funky stuff. Instead, there are nicer ways to do things. Um, so if we do my array. Let's, uh, let's make a new one called R, because I don't want to deal with that array, because it's all messed up now. Um, let's do one, two, three. Okay. Now, if we do, um, we, can, we can do something like R dot push. Arrays have a push function built into them. You can access that function using the dot. And if you do R dot push 10, what will happen is it will add 10 to the end of the array. You don't need to know how long the array is. You can just push. So if we do console.log r push 10, ooh, actually, will this work? I think this will work. Yeah, one, two, three, ten. You don't have to know how long the array is. You don't have to do the math as to which position it is. You can just push. Okay. Um, now, the opposite is also true. You can do pop. Um, and that will take the last value and remove it. Okay? Furthermore, you can get fancy. Um, you can actually set this to a value, my pop value. Uh, the pop function actually returns the value that was taken out of the array. Okay? 
So that's useful. However, you don't need to use it. You can just ignore it. Okay. Questions about this so far? There are also other array functions that are super useful, but we're only going to cover the basics here. Um, you can always Google JavaScript array functions if you want to see more. Um, so push adds to the end of the array. Um, pop removes from the end of the array and returns the new value. Ah, um, I believe and returns the new length. Let me test that though. It's been a little while since I needed to do that. Time log, that's cool, but that's not what I was looking for. Our new length, yeah, four. Okay. So this one adds to the end of the array and returns the new length, but you don't have to get the new length, you can just ignore it. And um, pop removes the last item and returns it, but you don't have to capture the return value. Okay? Good? You can also add a different position, right? Yes. That's, that's a function called splice, I think? I'm not sure. Um, but for purposes of time, we're not going to cover that. We are actually way over time. I apologize. It is 6 11. Um, so I'm going to burn through two more things, and then if you guys want to stay longer, you can. Otherwise, we should get out of here. All right. Um, all right. So cool. We have these arrays, but now, um, cool. We covered all that. Yep, we covered that. Good. Um, what if I want to go through each value in the array? We have something called, uh, or rather, uh, let's do, let's do. Actually, set aside arrays for a second because there's something else I want to show. Um, we're going to set a value let uh, counter, and we're going to start it at zero. And we're going to say, we're going to use this keyword called while, okay? And while is a loop. It allows us to do things repeatedly, okay? So we can say while counter is less than five, um, console.while counter, okay? And then uh, counter plus equals one. Uh, could also write counter plus plus, but later, okay? So now, if we do this, counter, oh, come on, oh, really dude, come on. Uh, ah, too much, okay, mistakes were made. Um, it, it printed zero. Um, so it ran this line five times. Once when, zero, once when counter was zero, once when counter was one, once when counter was two, three, and four, okay? Because while this condition is true, it will run what's inside the block over and over again, okay? Okay, um, while the condition is true, the code inside block will be repeated. Okay. Questions about that? Cool. That one's pretty simple. Um, this one is more complicated, but used more often. Okay. So we can do something like let i equal zero. I is just kind of a, a it's a it's a common usage. It's short for index. Index being a position and an array. So if we do i equals zero, i is less than the length of the array, and then i add one to the end. I'm going to comment this in a second with why it makes sense. Um, Console.log i. Okay. And this is also a loop. This will loop uh, i, and then we can also do console.log r i. Holy crap, typing is hard. Okay, there we go. Um, come on. There we go. Why did I make them one, two, three? 
I'm going to change this real quick, sorry. I'm going to make it, uh, where is it? I'm going to make it 4, 5, 6 just for kicks. Or we're going to make it A, B, C. We'll do that. Cool. Much better. All right. That makes much more sense, okay? So what happens is for initial, or run before the loop, before loop starts, okay? Um, when condition for continuing running, and then so these are semicolons, and then what to do at the end of the loop. Of what to do at the end, end of each run. Okay? Um, so in this case, we, we set a variable called i uh, to zero. Um, we check if i is less than the length of the array, and then we increase i by one. And so what we do is uh, we're increasing i uh, basically through the end of the array. This is how we loop through each item of the array. Okay? Does that make sense? Does this make sense? Yes, no? Good. Really, because most of the time when people see this for the first time, they're like, what the hell? Cool. All right. Good job, guys. Um, now, this is useful if you want to get the, the indexes of the array and the values, because using the index, basically the position, you can get the value, right, at that position. However, there are also cases where you only care about the value. You don't care what position is at, you just want the value, right? So there's one more syntax for loops. We can do for let value of r, and then console.log value in r. What? Hold up. Oh, ha, 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 ha. There we go. Okay. So this let of, what happens is it creates a new variable called value. And then for each value, or for each item inside the array, it's going to set value to that item. So the first item is A. So value is going to get set to A, and the loop is going to run. When the loop runs the next time, it's going to look at the next value, or the next item in the array, and it's going to set that to the variable value. Okay? Let's actually not call this value. Let's call this my array item, just to make things a little cleaner. It's going to be the same. Okay. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, that's loops. That's really cool because you can do something hundreds of times or thousands of times like that. Is that the end? Why does that stop? Yeah. Why does it stop? Yeah. It looks at the, well, my guess is that it looks at the length value. Okay. So it doesn't stop using bad values or anything? It just checks the length value? I believe so. Okay. Um, if we do something stupid like Let's just do a quick test. Do this guy again, now that we know that that's a thing. I believe, yeah. Yep, it does that. Okay. You can ignore that. That was just more advanced stuff that you don't need to worry about. Okay? All right. And uh, last... Last, let's say, mandatory piece. I am really sorry for running over time. Um, objects. So um, we've done, objects are basically, so arrays are how you can store things in order, right? An object is how you can store things by name, okay? So we can have something like um, my object. And similar to how const works with arrays, objects are the same. Okay, so you can modify the object inside, but you can't reassign the variable to a new object or to a new anything, really. Um, so I can do some object. Now you'll notice it's curly brackets. It's like a block, 
but it's not because JavaScript. Um, and we can do something like uh, object variable equals a, not equals colon a. And then we could do something like um, another variable. And then, OMG, a function. And once we've done this, well, first let's, let's go ahead and print this. I'm doing it this way. I'm not going to cover it yet. Um, yeah, silly dudes. Just, I want to go up like one pixel. Damn it. Okay, no. Okay. Well, this is the object. Okay. That's kind of cool. That's interesting. Okay. Um, now, what you can so so this is how you can define an object, right? Now you can just pass this whole variable around and everything inside it will go with it. Okay? So I can do something like my object, or I can do console.log, my object, or let's uh my object variable. And now I can do my object dot object variable. Okay? So this dot allows me to access things inside the object. Okay. All right, does that make sense? So now it should print A. Good. Additionally, I can do my object dot, oh my god, a function. And it'll run just like any other function. Okay. Does that make sense? So in this way, you could do something more interesting, and this is where, this is where like, JavaScript starts to get like really real. So you could have something like um, an author. Okay. And he can, ha or this person can have a name. Um, writer Nick. Ready face. Okay. And maybe they have an age of 45. I don't know. And um, maybe they have a function like uh, introduce self. We'll do an arrow function this time. And we can say something like, oh, geez. Do I want to do that right now? Yeah, I want to do that right now. Um, console.log, hi, I'm, oh, hi, I'm, uh, this dot me. We getting fancy now. Um, and then we could say, uh, say bye. We could say, function. I'm just, I'm just showing off the different function syntaxes. Normally, you would always use the same syntax. I'm just demonstrating. Um, console.log. Difference by. Okay. So now, this makes more sense, right? This is more like real JavaScript. This is more like what you'll use in the real world. You have some variable that represents some conceptual object in the real world. And that object has different properties. This this is an author object. It has a name. It has an age. There are certain things it can do, right? And we can we can get even more advanced. We can say um, const that or const, we can have an array of um, favorite authors, and we can say it's an array containing author, right? And then we can um, we could loop through 
for let's save author of favorite authors. Okay. And we can say author dot in, or sorry, fave author dot introduce self. Now this kind of demonstrates a whole lot of stuff. Or we could even go so far to say as if author or fave author dot age is less than 80 or something, I don't know. And this kind of shows off everything we've done. suck. Does this work? I don't know. I don't think that works. Crap. Nope. Ah, uh, whatever. I don't actually remember how to do this, so we're just going to do one of these numbers. It's been a little while since I've written JavaScript like that. So it's going through our list of favorite authors. In this case, we only have one. Okay, And then for each of those authors, if they're less than 80 years old, they're going to introduce themselves. This reads like English. This sounds like application logic. Right? This is like real, legit JavaScript. This is what you would see on a server or something, or on a website or something like that. Okay. And for all the critical stuff, and I apologize for being over time, but that covers everything that we really should cover in an introductory class. Um, there are other things too, and uh, I will I will add them to this before posting it online and include more detailed notes since I won't be here to explain it to you. Um, specifically, oh, where's my mouse? Okay, what? What? Okay, callbacks which is just functions, but used in a specific way. Uh, promises, um, which allow you to start something running and then finish it later, or wait for it to finish later. Async await, which is just a way to use promises more easily. Um, modules, which are ways to group uh, bodies of code into different files that you can then move and pass around. And then classes, which are like objects on steroids. Okay. What are callbacks? Callbacks are a special way of running functions. So you, you can, you, so functions, you'll notice here, I'll, I'll cover it super briefly conceptually. Um, you'll notice that I can specify a function like it's data, right? In, yes, in, exactly. in JavaScript, yeah, see, he's got it. <laughs> in JavaScript, um, they say functions are first class citizens. That means they're treated like any other data. So you can pass functions around like variables rather than always executing them. Um, so what you can do is if you have some function that's going to take some time to run, but then you want someone else to be able to run something whenever that function finishes, you can take some function as an input. When you finish your logic, then you can call that function that they gave you as an input. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's the same way, actually. OK. You specify who I believe that is what I read. Yes. So yeah, spot on. Did, did that make sense to everyone? If not, I'm going to do a write-up later to help it make more sense. So. Cool. But yeah, any questions? Uh, so just to recap, because um, that's what you do when you teach stuff, right? Um, today we covered setting up our environment on your computer so you can write JavaScript now. Um, taught you how to write comments so you can take notes. Taught you how to set up variables so that you can store data and then use it later. Um, functions in order to take code and not have to rewrite the same code all the time. Also to do different stuff based on inputs. Um, conditions so that your code can make intelligent decisions based on what the state of whatever is. Um, arrays so that you can have uh, data organized in a manner that you can go through it one by one. Uh, loops so that you can go through that data one by one and so that you can do any number of operations however many times you want. Um, and objects, where you can uh, intelligently group bits of data or even functions together into a single variable that you can then pass around as a nice packaged thing. 
Um, so, are there any questions about what we've covered today or, or anything really before we call it a night? So have you ever um, have you ever gone to a website and you start typing a password and then it tells you oh your password's not long enough mm -hmm. or you're missing a number that's JavaScript doing that. Okay. So what it's doing is the the browser sends or has events that occur and you can write JavaScript to listen for those events and then do stuff. So what it's doing is it's listening for key presses. And then it's checking the value inside that password form and seeing if it matches the rules that they set. And then if it does, then they update the HTML to say, hey, there's that red text that says, hey, you need to make it longer or whatever. Right. So currently JavaScript is the most popular one to use, or is it the only one? It's effectively the only one. Um, you can write stuff in other languages. Um, but what ends up happening is part of your workflow will eventually convert it to JavaScript. Because JavaScript is the only language that browsers really understand. Mm -hmm. There are other languages that are competing, but because the browser software needs to support it, mm -hmm. they all have to convert to JavaScript because that's the only one that the browsers understand. Specifically, I'm interested in a language called Dart, which is actually trying to compete with JavaScript. But have you heard of da Dart? Uh, no, because JavaScript is such a huge presence, there's not really any decent competition. So most everything gets translated to JavaScript. Even TypeScript gets converted to JavaScript when you run it in the browser. Yeah. Also awesome. about Ruby, Ruby on Rails, where we got this web development. So Ruby is just another language. It can do all the same things that JavaScript can do. They're both programming languages. They can do anything. Ruby on Rails is a server framework. Um, uh, for JavaScript uh, to run JavaScript as a server, you use an interpreter called Node, but that only allows you to run it as a process, basically what we've been doing here, outside of a browser. Um, but Ruby on Rails does more than that. Ruby on Rails also like has your um, active, 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 what's it called? Active, no, that's ASP. Um, there's a, I forget what it's called in Ruby on Rails, but basically, in addition to just being able to run arbitrary Ruby code on the server, because that's what Ruby does by itself, um, it sets up the whole web page framework for you too. It sets up routes and controllers and all that sort of stuff. Um, JavaScript has other tools to do that, like Express or Koa or Hoppy or Momo. Um, so Ruby on Rails is like this big giant thing, and it's an all-in-one solution written in the Ruby language. Um, what we just went over was the JavaScript language, and there are big giant things written in JavaScript that are similar to Ruby on Rails, but we have not covered that today. Does that answer your question? Yeah, the, the part I want to understand, like, the, the stuff JavaScript does for web development, can you do the same way with Ruby programming? Yeah. Um, it's just that JavaScript has been getting much more popular, and Ruby has been declining. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't learn Ruby or that Ruby is a bad language or anything or that no one uses Ruby. It's still in use. It's a language like any other. Uh, but JavaScript has become more popular. But they can do the same things. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Other questions? Cool. Well, thank you for coming, everyone. It was a pleasure. Um, if, uh, if you want to keep in touch with us, you can follow us on Facebook or Meetup. Additionally, we have a Discord channel. Um, and yeah, if you want to grab food, if we can grab food, I don't know. I'm going to go find some restaurant, and we can all do this together if you want. But beyond that, thank you for coming. Where is... Go and stop recording. Stop recording. Where's my mouse?